everybody. Welcome to our next panel session. Today, and now we talk one hour about automation. That's a very high-scale topic. And uh, just having heard the discussion about sustainability, this might be an aspect we can also include, but mainly it will be about technology industry 4.0. And first of all, I would like to introduce the panelists of today. We had some changes. Uh, due, to, due, due to some sicknesses, but anyway, we have great replacements. So first, I would, ladies first, like to introduce uh, Ibru Zaidin. She's SVP Marketing and Sales of Artistic Milliners from Karachi. She's based in New York, and she's an expert when it comes to everything denim. John Zorno from Subo, based in Seattle, USA. He is the founder and inventor of the sewing robot Subo. And he will let us know what else is in the pipeline and what we can expect in the future. Mr. Schmelzeisen comes from the, I don't know how to say it in English even, TH Aachen, this is like the word I know. <laughs> so he comes from the technology side, from the textile and fiber side. And uh, he will also talk to us about 4D textiles maybe. Maybe on other technologies and everything that we can also expect in the future of digitization and automation. The same for Dr. Fischer comes from the Fiber and Textiles Institute in Denkendorf. And he's also an expert in the details of textiles and fiber itself, not so much in the machinery, as I understood, but really about the materials. But of course, this is all connected. Of course, Mr. Baumann might agree. He comes again from the machinery side. Uh, he's the uh, product architect, if I got this right, from KUKA, based in Augsburg in Germany. And, uh, it's an automation specialist, robotics specialist over the years in various industries, but also in the consumer goods and fashion industry. So I think he also has some great things to share with us when it comes to robots and everything else. So thanks for this great international panel. Thanks for traveling here. And um, I would like to start, now we have this buzzword about industry 4.0. I put this in the technical direction over there, uh, looking at the three gentlemen first. So would you say, if we say industry 4.0, are we there yet? Or how, how far are we yet from reaching this thing? Maybe Mr. Baumann starts. I start and try to answer this. So it really depends on the industry where you're looking to. So there are some big industries like automotive, the car industry, where I would say they are like where they get a benefit out of uh, analyzing um, parameters and getting better in producing cars and getting more e efficient, then they do it already. What I think Industry 4.0 is useful for is the industry of the smaller entities because they benefit from standards that a big group of uh, factories and uh, a big uh, group of people do. They standardize some stuff of the communication, they standardize some sensors, some communication platforms, and there the mid-range and mid-middle entities, they benefit out of it. The gentlemen are nodding, so Dr. Fischer, what's your opinion about it? Are we, are we yet there, or is it like no. another 50 years that take us to Industry 4.0? Well, I think we are not there yet because it, it's Industry 4.0 is a big hype and now we see a lot of different subtopics and, and depending on the subtopic, we are more or less advanced. First of all, I would like to state that textiles play a special role in Industry 4.0 because textiles can be also connectors. Textiles can be cyber-physical systems by themselves, so uh, you have to distinguish the textiles as really parts of the networks, that your clothing is communicating with the room, with the environment, with everything. This is the one side, and there we are, partly. Textiles have in integrated sensors, they have integrated uh, actors, they have integrated uh, antennas for RFID, so textiles are a real, real good material for Industry 4.0, also for a lot of other sectors. This is the one side. The, the other side is, um, industry 4.0 for textiles and we see the classical mass production of fashion which is not fully digitized yet um, and to me industry 4.0 has a lot to do with digitization digital product development and then digital supported um, production along the, the chain up to the final part where we sew the past parts together or bring the parts together and there we are wow, maximum halfway I guess because for complete digital engineering, we, we don't have integrated all the steps yet. 
Do you agree, Mr. Schmelzeisen? Is it yeah, also your opinion? I, I, I would definitely agree, and maybe to, to, to name some problems, why, why we are not there yet. So, I mean, textile supply chain is super fragmented. You all know that when you want to go back to your basic material or know where your yarn comes from, it's, it's super difficult to, to, to actually access these kind of information. Um, and this makes it also very difficult to share information and data and information that's pretty much what this industry 4.0 is about because we need it to learn to understand where 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 our product stands and so on so so this makes it very difficult the second thing is what i at least saw the last five years especially on the machine side we have very very conservative players so uh, they very much think inside of their silos uh, it's not an open community often, so they don't share this kind of knowledge, they don't share the data, and it's, it's very difficult to access this. So this, for me, are two main problems why Industry 4.0 is not where it could be in the fashion supply chain. Uh, Jonathan, do you agree? Is it like people are too conservative to really get into something new? What, what's your experience? So I, I think that is part of it. Um, on the machinery side, the industry is old. The things that work, work well enough. And to make a change is to take on a risk. But when we talk about Industry 4.0 in the apparel industry specifically, uh, the thing to keep in mind, and my interest in robotics will show here, is that uh, people are doing almost all of the work. And Industry 4.0 is about gathering data, linking systems together, and if it's a person that's doing the work, then that person needs to stop their work to take notes or enter data into a system or distract from their actual labor task. And so if you're putting the burden on the worker, you know, you, you're necessarily taking efficiency away from them. And uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons why we haven't seen more inroads with data in, in those factories. I think, Ibru, this is something that affects your business directly because you're uh, you're working at the mill side, but also your company works in the manufacturing, garment manufacturing. Right. So how far is the process there when it comes to automation? And uh, I've recently been to the facilities, luckily. So there are, in fact, still very many human beings hands-on. In 20 years, will they all be gone? Or what do you think? Uh, yeah, well, we're, still, um, we're still having 18,000 people working in our uh, company because it's a vertical company. It's not just fabric, also garment manufacturing. Currently, uh, Industry 4.0 is more in the garment manufacturing side of the business. Uh, it is more like uh, in the washing and also sewing, but it doesn't mean that all, they're all robots in the, uh, you have already seen, uh, not any people. Because textile is a very labor-intensive industry, we still have to combine it together with the manual process. But where we've been uh, benefiting from Industry 4.0 is it's more like uh, the process control. And also currently, it is really helpful to collect data for uh, sustainability, meaning pr uh, doing the production or let me say transforming the production from conventional slash traditional systems to, you know, better practices or uh, better manufacturing systems. In the fabric, it's more like in the spinning. And then later, I'll, I'll show you how we do um, no human touch production in spinning. And also, we should, uh, we should also think about the retail part of it. Because in the retail, big data is so important so that we collect this information and use in, in our industry, in the manufacturing, and then uh, meet the needs of the end consumers. Dr. Fischer, you're nodding again. So how far are, when you're developing something, how far is your connection up to the end consumer? How much do you consider already what the end consumer could use or need? Well, I can relate to directly what you are saying. At the point of sale, we are currently working on a research project that is called Retail 4.0, so that basically tells everything. Um, and this is important to, to bring together the retail and the customer and also the producer in order to really get a feedback, I'm immediately at the point of sale and to have different uh, scenarios. And, and this goes then all the way back because if you have a consumer that is able to bring in his needs immediately at the point of sale and you have, a, we call it micro factory, you have something like a micro factory in the background of the big shop and you have a digitized production, then you can produce rather quickly while he's having a couple of coffees or going for somewhere else 
you can produce for the customer something one-to-one -one personalized. And this is the mantra of, of digitization. Everything that, will be, that can be digitized will be digitized, and everything that is digitized can be personalized. And this is the huge, huge opportunity for fashion. Because fashion is what we heard in the last discussion. It's about colors, it's about design, it's about personality, it's about expression of character. And, and this is the second part, it's about individual bodies. And this is unique in, in, in all the other products. Uh, we don't have this uniqueness of, of the, the, the things we need. We, we, theoretically, we all need different clothes, personalized clothes. Yeah, and I think, uh, and that's where, where technology comes, comes in to the field, because if we look, I mean, textile production chain, we can divide it pretty much to when, when uh, a, a piece of garment is produced or the textile is produced. So weaving, uh, knitting, and before this, so yarn making and also the fiber treatment, these are all uh, yeah, man-made fibers, so fiber spinning. These are actually very automated processes. So when you go into a weaving mill, you, 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 won't, you, you hardly see any human. And this is what a lot of people forget. And it's super cheap automation. Yeah? When you go uh, to buy some uh, Rita yarn making machine, yeah? a spinning machine, these machines, they only cost like 7,500 euro for a completely robotized machine. It's, it's crazy. Yeah? It's, it's, it's a real far development. And that's where we actually would have all the data that we need, but we can't access it. And now if we go more into retail concept, if we directly connect them, so if we have, for example, yarn spinning and out of this automated dyeing and then go more into, for example, knitting, where I can have a whole knit sweater, which is somehow 3D knit, then I'm very close to an end product and I can go around my CMT stuff, which is uh, cutting, sewing, and that's where, at the moment, robots are not that far because it's a very, very difficult work to do for a robot to actually handle, I think you know that better than, than, than me, but to, to handle textiles, yeah. Jonathan, I think, yeah, what, what, what's the state of the art right now when it comes to suing robots? Well, in, uh, in factories, um, with maybe one or two exceptions in China, the robots, as they exist, are more advanced sewing machines. They require a human operator, and the, and the machine can do sewing, setting pockets, uh, belt loops, uh, even some relatively complex tasks like putting collars together, but the fabric itself has to be handled by a worker. So if that worker needs to go and take a bathroom break, then the machine doesn't run. And um, I think that's you know, an area that, that we can improve on. Does KUKA have already a solution for this, or are you also working in this field of fashion, obviously? So we look in the field of fashion industry and we see that it's very difficult, I totally agree. And the thing is, the things that are easier to automate are the ones that are usually not value-adding. So the real suing and the thing where the human is better in feeling and seeing the things and then uh, suing them or stitching them, um, there the robot is not doesn't have the capability yet, or the technology to give the robot the capability is too slow or too expensive. So the non-value adding task for like sorting or handling some stuff, easy stuff, it's also some difficulties in different uh, materials, but uh, this non-value adding task you could automate, but very often the, the cost of the automation is too high that you just don't do it right now. But if we think, for example, 50 years from now, maybe, if oh. you have a future scenario, of course, everything could be possible, but what do you think will be realistically possible? What is doable? What will a, a facility, a production facility look like in two, three decades from now? It's difficult to say. What I can see, a trend is that the robots get more smart and more sensitive. So if the robot kinematic together with the tool is that sensitive that you could realize in a fast way, like the, the handling is pretty fast, that you can feel if you have one textile or two textile uh, stitching, not uh, gluing together, and you can separate them and then feed the sewing machine, I think this yeah, I think it's, it's two or three decades from now, it's, it's really, it will be there. Yes. So, yeah, and uh, so we roughly say it's worth to automate around 40% of, of sewing, um, which means uh, simple steps, uh, 2D um, 
but only 2D if I don't need to pretty much uh, change something in my fabric and if I have a high amount of the same fabric because that's very difficult at the moment at least for robots to learn what, what, what different fabrics I have. On the other hand, it's, it highly depends also on the business model of, uh, of factories because at the moment when I go to a factory, they would tell me, hey David, I have an ROI of maybe a year. So when I have a return on, of invest of a year, I can't invest in uh, KUKA robots. Sorry, it's not possible, uh, especially if uh, someone costs 1.80 US dollar an hour. It's, it's just not possible. And also this is the same thing for research in this area. It's very, very difficult to make meaningful research uh, on these kind of topics because there's no real business case at the moment at least uh, when you want to replace very difficult tasks that a human is, is capable of doing um, and uh, who only costs, I don't know, uh, seven euros a day. But wouldn't you say that this is like also a key problem because if the labor cost would be higher, it has a realistic price in sourcing countries like Pakistan, like Bangladesh, then in the end it would be become so expensive to hire humans and maybe we could even think about KUKA or SUBO robots? I think it's going to be a lot about assistance. So um, I would say we're going to have uh, collaborative robots that can help me with some special task and as a human I can train maybe even individually at my workplace so that I can outsource process steps that are very repetitive that I actually maybe don't like to do or which I know are not very efficient so I can hand them over to the robot and really concentrate on quality and uh, also value adding process steps that I do on my own and that's where I see where, where robots and humans will somehow collaborate and, and that's where I see robots in the future in the fashion industry. Uh, if I may, uh, just add to that for a moment. Um, I've been quite surprised when manufacturers reach out and try to learn more about automation. You know, they don't, I, uh, costs are important. ROI is, you know, basic business laws. But um, when, the, when the manufacturers reach out and, and want to talk about automation, they're not talking about the costs or anything like this. They're talking about the headaches of their labor force, that they need to go and train, recruit and train thousands of workers every month just to fulfill their existing orders. And in some places, they can't get those workers, and they need to build new factories elsewhere. And this is um, you know, almost to the point where, from a leadership perspective, their business isn't making clothes. It's just recruiting and training people. And um, that seems to be a pretty unsatisfactory situation for them. And uh, I think that's one of the, the greatest appeals of robotics is um, basically making the job of the management easier. Well, talking about this global trends in 20, 30 years, I see three developments. I think that the labor costs in the so-called cheap countries now is going to grow or is going to, to be higher. Um, the second one is that uh, we need, in terms of sustainability, a fair calculation of the transportation costs. And the third one is that, in terms of circular economy, we will have a lot of material back in the markets where people use it. And it doesn't make really sense to, to collect recycled material and to ship it back to the Far East and then ship it back again. So we have to reuse it and to, to work with the material here where the markets are and where the consumers are. And I think this, this calls really for, for small regional production centers and units um, where we'll, we'll be able to have the material in different ways of, of recycling is possible. We see a lot over there. And we will have the technology available. And as we have still high labor costs, I think the technology will, be, have, will have a return on investment that is feasible. So I think these global trends support that we will have not the big, big, big manufacturing, but regional, personalized, whatever we call it, still micro factories uh, here in Europe, at least to cover part of the demand. So, Ibru, then your company will be out of business if we go more local, or do you think you will produce like in, in two years yourself in New York then again? So Hopefully not very soon. <laughs> well, the thing is, we will definitely be there, and there's still a lot to do. Uh, while we were talking, um, I just want to bring up, because we're always talking about the stitching part, mostly, majorly, the stitching part of it, but um, I want to bring up the Levi's Game Changer FLX project, because in the morning, uh, before I come here, I was rereading uh, how 
uh, rereading the article, how Levi's FLX project changed the whole industry, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, washing. Uh, it's not just the efficiency; it is also uh, the time, uh, the time scheme. Meaning, before it was already like six months to uh, do all the garments, and uh, I'm, I'm talking about the collection timing to present to designers and then get the decision and go back and you know um, replenish. But now, it, it, the, the time is very short, and this is uh, bringing a lot of advantages both for the brand as well as the uh, as well as the manufacturer and also for the consumer because they're getting more and uh, I would say they're getting more new stuff in in the store so um, when you talk about the micro factories I was also thinking about the current situation about China the supply chain because two days ago, I saw an email from my supply chain because they're not able to go to office in Hong Kong. They're not able to send me the pattern so that I could produce and send to my customer in Greensboro. Interesting, right? So it, it is interesting because whatever, I mean, think of so with all China, technology, uh, a virus can, you know, just quickly. <laughs> immediately ruin the whole thing. So. Uh, the micro factories, or I think they call it nearshoring. I, I, I think that's the right wording. Uh, this is definitely be so important because we don't know what's going to happen. All these force majeure thing, politically, um, I don't know, historically, uh, that can definitely affect all our yeah, supply chain. Things. There was one prominent example in the media, though, about Adidas and the micro factories, which they have obviously. Close. There was one so far as I know. So it doesn't show this, maybe, or have they been too early? Were they too early at the stage? Because I mean, we would have liked to have somebody from Adidas here, of course, but not possible. Um, or is it like still not possible to do micro factories in that sense with the current supply chains we still need in the fashion industry? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, we designed uh, parts of the micro factory with Adidas, so uh, especially the sewing and, and knitting parts. Um, and what I have to say, I mean, it was a very ambitious project. And the aim at that time was to automize up to 100% of the process, um, which is interesting from a research perspective, because you, you set a high, a high a task and then a high aim, and somehow you want to get there. And then on the way, you learn that maybe it's uh, good to automize, as I said, about 40% and leave the rest to humans. And that's maybe what Adidas learned and said, okay, for this kind of product and the supply chain that I have, and also the number of goods that we actually produce, it makes more sense to, to do it somewhere else. And that's, I think, also your point. If we come to micro factories, uh, it, will, it will change. Also, the micro factories, it will not be, I take the machines that are today available for mass production and put them into a micro factory. That's what we do today, us as well, because we don't have any other possibilities. But actually, the whole machine concept and also the factory layout need to change if we want to build these kind of micro factories. And also how we work with material, how we guide information and so on. All of this needs to change if we really want to have these micro factories close to us. So at, out of curiosity, just quickly, yeah. uh, what percentage of the speed factory would you say was automated? I would say 70. Mm. So do you think the remaining labor was just enough to make it unfeasible in the local market? No, I would just say uh, a high degree of automation today uh, makes it very unflexible. Mm. Uh, yeah, this would be my comment on this. Thank you. Well, maybe it was partly old technology, and, and I was at ISPO two weeks ago here, and if you look at a player that is not from the fashion business, if you look at a player like HP, they have technology where they have, uh, they bought, invested a lot of in, in scanners, in food scanners, and now they are able to 3D print, this is not a textile process, 3D print individual soles that really match your walking behavior. And this is the first step to build a shoe that is really fully personalized, not only in terms of color, this is easy, but in terms of real personalized function. But this includes a new supply chain, a new digital supply chain. And this will also cover your problems because we need, we have digital fashion, we have 3D fashion uh, where we will need much less samples, much less physical samples. Mr. Baumann. 
Yeah, and one problem is still the humans that they also need to want the things that you automate and that you manufacture. Like HP has the benefit or the advantage that if you put it into your shoes, the sole, the, the inlay, um, then it fits totally to your foot, but nobody sees it. But if you manufacture a shoe that looks not that nice, but it's fully automated, it doesn't bring you anything because nobody will buy it. And this is the thing. So as long as you cannot influence the people in this way that they want to buy an automated shoe and also to bring the designers that they design to manufacture and not design for their purpose to realize a new trend. Um, as long as this is not the, the way, then um, it's also difficult to automate because you never know how a shoe will look like. And, and this is one last comment. This is also, um, if you look at innovation theory, and it's always if there's new trends, new technologies, new S-curves involving, there will be players from outside the sector. And this is what we experience here. We have KUKA, which is not definitely in the textile business, and there could be HP, which was never at all in the textile business. So we all have to learn that there will be players from outside. So and this do you is think really it's a, a revolution. Is it a realistic scenario that if we look at current facilities, they will be torn down one day? Because would, would, a, would a producer have to tear them down and rebuild them completely? Because at the current state, you have small machinery, you have human beings there, you need like facilities for the human beings. Can we forget all about this and have to tear it down and rebuild? Is it realistic that you can slowly change within a facility the processes? I don't know exactly how it looks like, but if we imagine a Spotify for, for clothing, it's different. It will be definitely different. We, there is no need to, to produce CDs anymore. And I think there will still be goods that needs to be produced in an in a, in a old-fashioned way, pretty much, because we like them as they are, and it's still fashion, and we want them to be this way, especially if we talk about, I don't know, second-hand or vintage clothes, whatever. But then uh, I think we also need, on a design perspective, to rethink this uh, fast fashion, for example. Fast fashion doesn't need to be bad, right? But at the moment, we make fast fashion as a good that is maybe low quality, but still from an engineering perspective, is way too high for only wearing it once. But now if we would think about a 3D printed dress, as a technologist, I would say 3D printing has nothing to do with textile because we don't get the mechanical properties that we need. But at the same time, if someone would tell me, yeah, David, but I only want to wear it once for this one evening, and I, then it's actually the mechanical properties will be sufficient. You can't wash it but maybe you don't need to wash it. You print it out, you wear it once, you bring it back, and then you give it to someone so he can make a new polymer out of it and you can print a new piece of clothes. And if we rethink this kind of model, then it actually makes sense to do it. It's not a classic textile anymore, but it's still fashion. So building up another future scenario, could it be realistic that in the near future we all have like a three, 3D printer at home, we just print our own little whatever we want to have, wear it one day, and tomorrow I'm going to print something else. I know this sounds very, you know, Captain Future, but still, is this something that would be doable or realistic, even though the whole retail business will, of course, go down the drain? Well, if you look at other, other businesses, I think 20 years ago, people had more printers and trying to print photos at home as they do now. And now they send it again to CV or to Photobook or whatever. I think they really, everybody has a machine in terms of maintenance, in terms of, of inks, in terms of everything is a bit difficult. But this was the overreaction, and now we have a, a compromise, let's say, that we have printing shops and printing facilities close by. So maybe not everybody at home, but maybe in the, in the cities or in the, in the suburbs or whatever, we will have printing shops. But I was thinking still consumers will be um, designers in future, meaning uh, because thinking of the denim business, you know, it's usually fit, fabric, and finish, or maybe sometimes you can change the other two, uh, the second and third uh, rank of the F. Uh, the thing is still we will need micro facilities to produce it, but when consumer becomes the designer, then having all the fabric or the wash or the stitching color, whatever, they can design it and then they can have their own uh, jeans because currently there are body scanning systems. I know in the, uh, in the past there were a couple of brands who wants to do, it, do, do that, but that time that was so difficult. But body scanning is nothing new. And on the other hand, if a micro facility, in, for example, in my situation producing 
you know, almost like 3 million units per month. That's insane to do that, but why not? Why not? It, it can't be done. Maybe not 3D at the moment, but still selecting all the givens all the, from the default pool and then make your own genes. That might be possible. I think WeJ is also like experimenting with that where you as a consumer can give your body data and then they try to customize because the fit obviously is something very uh, difficult when it comes to genes. Uh, so they're experimenting with it. I don't know if it's really that successful yet, but definitely there's something in the pipeline. Um, At least it doesn't, it doesn't seem impossible. No, it's in the, it's, I mean, we can, it's already there, I would say. Um, Jonathan, your Subo robot is currently is like made for sewing jerseys, is that right? Um, because we have a denim expert here yeah. and we know denim because I really would like to uh, more focus on the, on the stitching and sewing side of denim. Well, it's like, yeah. is, is there anything in the world, I have do, done my research but mm -hmm. maybe not good enough, is there a robot already that's able to properly sew by itself a pair of jeans? You mean like with a needle? Yeah, yeah like, like a sew bowl for denim. Ah, um, not really at the moment, no. Uh, you see those tools, like I said before, pocket setters and things like this, but uh, it's a very, very manual process. Um, I'll mention, it was actually denim uh, that got me interested in this and inspired the whole project. So um, it's true, we've mostly been working with lighter materials, but um, that's just to do with the complexity of genes. Um, as the robot skills improve, I think that's going to be probably the, re the real sweet spot for automation. These relatively complex products that require a lot of labor and are sold in very large volumes. At the same time, I would, for the jeans example, if you look into a sewing facility for jeans, you have, I don't know, at least 16 people sitting behind each other. So I wouldn't think about one robot for 16, okay? But uh, we could think about, and even with solutions that are today available on the market, uh, that can maybe handle the task of five or even up to ten of these 16 persons for a jeans factory. But then also a jeans factory changes. Because for a robot, it's, for example, if we stay with jeans, much easier to handle a 1.50 centimeter broad 2D flat uh, woven piece. So if we put our pockets, for example, on top of the jeans before we cut it, right? This is a very different way of thinking, but that's what makes it much easier for a robot to handle it. And then afterwards I cut it, and then I can have, for example, a Vtron machine that can do very long 2D seams, no problem. But then when it goes into the 3D seam, they would directly hand it over to a well-trained worker, and that's how you have to think it. And that's, then you really have to re rethink how your production line is set up. You have to rethink how you also design stuff because you need a different design from a washing perspective afterwards. So yeah, it's, it's quite complex. You're even one step ahead with the 4D textiles. Could you maybe quickly, quickly explain <laughs> what this is all about? Yeah, uh, so we call it 4D is like 3D which evolves over time. Um, so, I mean, it's still a marketing thing, I have to admit. Uh, it's in the prototype stage. It's, it's not in the like prototype stage, but also the name. I mean, if you, if you would say, uh, I, I wear jeans and I have like a wear out, you could call that 4D, right? But uh, we said if it doesn't have any purpose, we don't call it 4D. That's also what our colleagues from MIT, for example, say. And then, uh, yeah, what do we do is we, we use uh, textiles that are elastic. We pre-stretch them. And then uh, we can stitch or we, we can add some kind of stiffness. And then if you uh, release the force, uh, you will see that it somehow gets a 3D shape. Um, and uh, I have one work which I like a lot uh, back in the hall with, the, with a small uh, designer group from the Netherlands. It's called Unseam. It's a black dress. And actually the, the upper part was, was made in this kind of way. So we, we had a, a 2D fabric, pre-stretched it, uh, had, had some elements that we stiffened, and then it came into this kind of 3D shape. And it helps actually to, to, to lose some of the complexity where I put 2D pieces together to build a 3D piece. What, what would the idea be? Would it be like in the morning I get up and then I wear a pyjama and it changes its shape and becomes my, my suit to go to work, and in the evening it becomes my 
athleisure outfit or is it thinking? No, for, 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 for fashion at the moment we, we find it actually in sportswear. So uh, Nike has a nice example uh, in the back of one running shirt and it's actually like uh, it's a woven piece of fabric, 3D woven piece and when it wettens uh, parts of it uh, expand so uh, these flaps open. And this means that when I start to sweat, these flaps at the back open and I get more of moisture control, I get more air into it. And this is kind of this 4D idea, so I use a defect maybe, but uh, to, to get some kind of function. We also do uh, 4D scanning, uh, where we don't take a static scan, but a dynamic scan. So this is also 4D when we look at the morphology of the human body over time when he's doing movements, when he's doing sports moving, movements, we can imagine that uh, the parts of the body which we don't like that much, the, the body fat and stuff, that is moving. And this is difficult for, for clothing to, to be handled. Would you agree though, I mentioned that earlier, that many things are still in the prototype stage and they rest there, so there's no progress? Because we've all been at many uh, fabrics fairs, textile fairs, seen so many innovations, and I hardly see anything in the market then finally. That goes for denim, as well as for jerseys, knits, wovens, whatever we can talk about. Do you have the same impression coming from the textile side, and why is it so, if you agree? Well, we have a lot of disruptive things, and disruptive things uh, have to face a lot of resistance because consumer behavior and classical consumer behavior. It would be no problem to have a little scanner in these uh, shops that offer the orthotics and uh, the biomedical knitting textiles, and it would be no problem to have a scanner and to have personalized things. But the whole business model changes. The question if the insurance uh, covers the thing because it's not a pre-made product anymore, but it's an individualized solution. So the whole system needs really to change. And, and whenever you have these disruptive innovations, there's a lot of force against them. And the other thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, if the disruptive innovation doesn't actually address a bottleneck, instead it just improves the efficiency of something else in a production environment, then it's not really worth the investment. So uh, I was very curious to see how automated cutting had been taken up by the industry. I see that as being probably the most recent major innovation. And I was asking um, an executive from one of the companies what he estimated the, uh, the percentage of global clothing that was made with automated cutters. Mm -hmm. And he estimated that at less than 50% for the world. Mm -hmm. So. At you the know, current stage, you would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. was maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, this is, well, as somebody who's trying to bring new technology and this is somewhat daunting, um, because these tools were introduced 50 years ago, and we still see, you know, maybe 40 or whatever percent uh, uptake. So, you know, it, it kind of comes down to like, well, this is useful, but that's not actually what the problem was, because manufacturers, you know, they can cut as many pieces as they need. That's not where their bottleneck is. Uh, Mr. Baumann, bringing in other industries now, we heard that KUKA, of course, is also very famous uh, in the, or very um, successful in the automobile industry. Would you say that those really other industries are more advanced, they're more future-driven, they're more open to new technologies, and what could the fashion industry learn from other industries in that sense? I think the difference is that they just had the pain much earlier than in other industries because manufacturing a car was really tough, hard work for the people. And then they had the pain that they needed worker and to, to a lot of worker to manufacture a car. And then developed by time, it's the example I mentioned before, uh, over time they developed the cars to made, uh, they des are designed to manufacture actually. And nowadays you cannot build a car without automation anymore. So you cannot do it manually welding or anything. So you need the robots. And I think this will develop in the fashion industry as well that after a time, it can, it can be decades, um, the industry changes also and maybe some day you will not be able to manufacture a certain part by hand anymore because you need to do it automated because the, the fabrics or the, the steps to manufacture it, them uh, need to be automated. And there, the, yeah, I would say the pain in the automotive industry was just much earlier and they are many years uh, in advance because they started earlier, but uh, after the time in the other industries, it's going to be the same, I guess. So do you think the pressure in the fashion industry is not that high yet? Not yet, yeah. 
And I also think uh, there's also two ways. You always talked about the micro uh, factories. And I think even in the future, it will be a long time that we have two ways in parallel. So the mass production for the people that want to afford a cheap uh, piece of um, clothes. And the other ones that want to have the individual individualized one, and they also pay more for it because they want to have a, a very nice suit or anything. And I visited some suit manufacturer in Italy some last year, and there were some steps that I told them, ah, you know, we can automate that. For example, the buttonhole stitching, and they told no way. The people pay for it that it is manual. Mm -hmm. So I think there's two ways: the one for mass production, and the other one for the individualization. Yeah. What I would add, also, you need skill set. I mean, uh, if you go to a factory for car manufacturing, for example, so we did automation on textile with car manufacturers, not only on seats, but uh, as you know, BMW used a lot of carbon fiber in their cars for i8, i3. So this is, again, a textile, actually, that you need to handle in your process. But these guys were not able to handle any kind of textile in their factories, so we needed to automate this process. And KUKA was also, actually, uh, they have some robots in, in these kind of factories. And there you see, okay, you have lots of experts in a facility uh, for car manufacturing that actually know what they are doing when they talk about robots and teach us, who are more like a textile background, okay, what can we do? And then we work together and build these kind of setup. Now, when you enter a production facility for, uh, I don't know, shirt making, you don't find these experts, right? They do it the way they did it the last years, and they don't have the pressure at the moment to change that, actually. So how, how, how do you come together to change it? And I think that's key. We need to bring people with these different uh, backgrounds and this knowledge together and form kind of agile teams to then uh, build these kind of robots or automation solutions. I know you created this platform or you were uh, co-founding the Genius Text, if I'm not mistaken, or various platforms where people can exchange about what they need and what smart textiles are around. And still, could this, uh, to bring in a new dimension, aspect of sustainability, that everybody discusses right now in the fashion industry, could this help to higher the pressure and uh, to find new ways of production? Because now the consumer might even ask for it and uh, the good old cotton needs too much water, so we also need new textile solutions? There are definitely new textile materials ahead. Uh, when first, when it comes to technical textiles for carbon-based fibers, we, we're working on um, carbon made out of uh, natural resources, so this is big step, I think, and this will, will also maybe be in the fashion industry. But just one last comment to the, to the technical thing. If we move a little bit outside of fashion, but stay in the textile areas, we have a lot of successful collaborations with robots. If you look at uh, architecture, if you look at uh, these pavilions that are made for Expo, uh, fiber reinforced material, there are robots that are building their whole house, basically. That's a perfect collaboration because the material and the processes are made for each other, they are adjusted, and, and this is something that was developed in parallel and ma makes a perfect fit. But a traditional cotton t-shirt was developed a hundred, couple of hundred years ago, and it was definitely not developed for being handled by a robot, so it doesn't make a perfect fit. So the aspect of sustainability, so I, if, I, if I hop on to that, is also something that your company is very busy with. Um, it's mostly also on the, on the finishing side, obviously. So uh, what's the process there? Do we one day see like a zero chemical uh, production and, and maybe only ozone? And, and uh, yesterday I learned about uh, uh, ice, uh, dry ice um, methods. Uh, what, what's, what's in the making there? Uh, there are so many different technologies and best practices that has already been, I mean, currently we've been using. Uh, but definitely there are two main things. One of them is water, the consumption of water. And then thanks to these technologies, you'll be able to, uh, it's, not, it's not the strategy. You also have to have the assets, the technology behind so that you will be following up your strategy. So when it comes to consumption of the natural resources, uh, definitely Industry 4.0 is helping a lot. And of course, the chemicals and the recycling of the chemicals um, and the effluent, the, uh, the water that we, have been, uh, that we have been treating. 
So, um, for example, this year uh, we've been recycling 85% of our water, and uh, as of 2025, our commitment will be 92% of the water that we have been using to be recycled. And again, uh, these are all thanks to these kind of technologies. Uh, and it's not just uh, controlling the consumption, but also technologies that are helping us to recycle it. Uh, at this moment, I cannot say it's going to be 100%, but at least when I'm talking about 85 and then up to 92, these are really significant numbers, I believe. So also this request and maybe also the moral need to work more sustainable puts this more pressure and brings the technology ahead or uh, yeah. because I mean we still see many examples where it's not working yet and there's so much greenwashing in the industry still oh, yeah. so um, but you have a you have a good feeling and like a good prognosis for, for yeah. that uh, first of all thanks to all brands who are really pushing us to come with better options improvements the second thing is I totally agree with you. Um, sometimes I'm also, you know, marketing person. Sometimes this greenwashing or fluffy language. It's also confusing the brands, designers, developers there. The most important thing is to work with the uh, credible third party uh, certification companies um, or institutions like Cradle to Cradle, like Blue Sign. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. To, to be working with the right people. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you in that sense when it comes to greenwashing. And I would say uh, if we go back to the topic of robots, especially in genes manufacturing with companies like Bach or Genologia, we have seen that not for the sewing process, but for many other processes, actually sustainability, the topic of sustainability brought more and more innovation in, in robots into the system. Sometimes you think, does it really make sense? I mean, do I need a spraying robot for a chemical that I don't want people to inhale? Uh, do I want to wear a chemical that workers are not uh, able to inhale? I don't know. But um, yeah, we see, okay, with the aim of sustainability in regard also of social aspects and uh, working conditions, there are already a lot of automation and, and, and robots happened and came into the industry and, and make a big change, actually. And um, also enable smaller lot sizes, for example, and less, less waste. Because I know, OK, this pair of jeans, I can design it one by one. I will all throw them in the same washing machine at the end and dye them maybe in the same way. But still, when I take them out and I can sort them by RFID, I'm able to have an individual design. So uh, there's where actually already today robots help us a lot to, uh, to, to be more sustainable. And as we look to the future with 4.0 industrial intelligence or more automation in the production process, I think the biggest impacts in terms of sustainability will be waste, as you say. Because if you can predict your purchasing needs more accurately or if you can produce much more responsively, either because you're pulling data from databases or because you're actually able to near shore production due to labor cost reductions. Um, that means that you're not marking stuff down, you're not shredding your luxury goods that don't sell. Um, you know, if, if you've gone to the trouble of making the textiles and cutting and sewing and shipping around the world back and forth and back and forth, but then nobody buys it, well, that's all for nothing. So if you can avoid all that, then that's a huge impact. So add one more thing. I think we should also think about the transparency or traceability of the goods that we have been producing. Uh, maybe I have already mentioned about the certification process that the blockchain technology will be helping us for future, not only follow up uh, what has been inside as an ingredient in our uh, product, but also for the end consumer to follow up or to make the uh, decision for the good uh, purchase. So currently, you know, it's said that Generation Z is very much interested in buying sustainable products, but they don't know where to buy it or how to, uh, how to understand that they are really buying the sustainable product. That way, I think uh, Industry 4.0 will be helping a lot with the blockchain technology, I guess.
collecting data, bringing data together, and this will be the future. Um, to circle back to the initial question, do we need to be or don't be afraid of robots, actually, uh, which is then uh, coming to the social responsibility aspect. And since we're approaching the end of this great discussion, I would like to throw this in as the last question. What shall we do with the people that we do not need anymore on the workplaces? Mr. Baumann, <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> Your solution the now, please. The has to answer the question. <laughs> um, I think the first step is to make the people more efficient. So we don't get rid of the people. We just um, make them more efficient. That in, in what term? You mean more efficient, like they that, uh, better skills? Or tasks that mm -hmm. they are annoying and they are repetitive. They don't need to do anymore. And they have more time to really design and to manufacture a great piece of textile. And then, after time, in the evolution, it will still be some jobs, but the jobs are going to be different, for sure. But there will be the same amount of jobs, and sometimes in some regions even more. Because um, when you can reshore, for example, and you can manufacture closer to the place where the, the things will be purchased, you are more sustainable because you don't need to ship them back and forth. And also, um, the people then there get other jobs, different jobs than in the past. So first, make the people more efficient and then um, get different jobs in the local area. Yes. Everybody agrees? And what, what, what yes. shall these different jobs be? We just talk about different jobs, but what, where do we find them? Well, or do we create them? They, they, will they will evolve. There's no problem because uh, th this was the big dream of automation since the hundreds of years that uh, people will have to have work less. And, and now we are afraid that we don't have any work. So it's a bit weird. And, and I think if we distribute the work fairly, then we all would be happy if we would work 20% less. So if all benefit from the automation, why not? I mean, that's, that's still a good thing. And I agree that there will be new jobs. There will be creative jobs. There will be jobs that fit more to the human nature. Humans are not made to, to work like robots, but they are made to work with their brain and their creativity and their hands and everything. And if we, we create more humanized work, then why not? Yeah, I had actually a really interesting discussion about this topic with uh, the minister in Nordrhein-Westphalia where we have a coal mining problem, right? And we want to close these coal mines so everyone is like, oh, what, what can these people do afterwards? And I was like, hey, if we get a collaborative fashion production, it would be super or cool. Or Siemens to can hire it. them in Australia, right? Yeah. They can just bring them there. And uh, we could have like a collaborative fashion production in Nordrhein-Westphalia. Why not? We could use uh, old, worn pieces, uh, upcycle them. Um, there we need a lot of creative people. We need a lot of people who really want to think about new processes and who would like to somehow have this new work environment, maybe together with a cobot, so that they can really focus on some meanif meaningful work. And uh, I think that's, that's going to be the future, and it's going to raise jobs instead of uh, killing jobs. But are, you, are you agreeing with, the, let's say you have 18,000 people working in uh, Karachi or all around the world, let's say 10,000 maybe you can get rid of in 10 years, what shall those workers do? I just want to give you an example when it comes to, you know, going, uh, let me say, manual to uh, digital process. Ten years ago, we were trying to train really good um, hand sanders who has been doing beautiful whiskers, beautiful chevrons on the garments. And then it really needs time to, uh, you know, train them because we want to get that natural, beautiful, worn out look. But now we need laser operators who will be able to manage the, uh, manage the machines uh, the thing is, it's only the skill set is changing. It was first manual, but still we need that whiskers and chevrons and the hand sanding. But now we're doing it with the machine, but now we need the operator who would be able to operate the machine. But wouldn't you say where there were five people before, there's now only one person acquired? So what, what are we doing with the four people that we don't need anymore? And yeah, number of the people will be definitely changing, but it doesn't mean that we're, we're going to be firing them all. Definitely there will be other areas. Uh, and the other thing is, you still have to train the people who are already in your, um, in your pool, and then you can also use them at different let me say, operations, because when it comes to data manufacturing, it's a very complex uh, process, and there have been so many steps, and some steps can 
some steps in the manufacturing can be combined in the operation, but some steps, as gentlemen has uh, already, gentlemen have already mentioned, you still need the human, uh, let me say, monitoring or controlling. Jonathan, agree? No need to be afraid of any machine or robot. Well, I think the Not one. Of yours, of course. I know. The, the one thing to keep in mind when we talk about this, particularly with regards to the apparel industry, is um, there is tremendous turnover in these workforces. Um, in some markets, I know in India, they were telling me their average worker lasts for less than a year. So almost none of the people who have these jobs today would be affected by this at all. And instead, the people who are affected are those in developing countries who are now deprived this first rung on the ladder of development. And I don't know if that's necessarily our responsibility. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, it's nice that the apparel industry helps people, but you could also argue that they're taking advantage of them and that there are a lot of, you know, well-meaning groups in the world, NGOs, the UN, whomever, who focuses on development. So, you know, we need to develop undeveloped countries. People should have the same living standards. Um, but, you know, it's not like everybody's going to get fired all at once. It'll be a slow transition as the capabilities of the systems improve. Um, I think uh, most of the sort of transition will actually be pretty graceful. Is this something you, you realize in your work environment or when you speak to people that they are afraid of technology, especially maybe in Germany? Or would you say, okay, all your so, friends maybe are like working engineers no, no, and stuff. No, but no, no, no. <laughs> but when I, for example, in, in Sri Lanka, I, I, I admire uh, one of my clients in Sri Lanka. He built a business with 60,000 workers in it in Sri Lanka. And he told me, David, uh, I built this business uh, because technology came in. Right? I, I would not be here if technology over the 30 years didn't evolve and help me to build this business. And now I'm losing my workers actually because when they come into the factory they learn stuff and then after the, at the end of the month 3%, 3% every month uh, go somewhere else into, a different, into another industry because it's one of the hardest working industries that you can work in in Sri Lanka. So he told me, hey David, if you can bring robots into my factory that helps my workers and that I don't lose every month 3% of them and need to retrain them, it would be so great. And maybe in two or three years we would be 70 or 80,000 because I can still train 3%, but I will, they will stay because of help in like very difficult tasks. And that's also the picture that I have in mind when I think about robots and fashion industry. It's more about collaboration and help and make work better for the workers. Thanks so much. You still have a video you wanted to show and share with us? Feel free to start it. Yeah, I think everybody feels free, feels open to remain another five minutes, obviously. Yeah.
Is it on? Yeah, no, it's on. Thanks for sharing this. So I think that was a good roundup of what's uh, uh, the state of art in, in the denim industry these days. Are there still any questions? Yes. The factory is in Karachi. 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 Any other questions to the gentleman and the lady up front? Thanks so much for joining. Thank you for being here, for sharing your time. It was super interesting. Hope to stay in touch. And um, good day to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.